Welcome back, everybody. Derek Sue, your 2022 Oakland mayoral candidate. Well, today is February 23rd. Uh, yesterday was a very uh, rough day for me um, as I got word that my uh, best friend and uh, um, confidant, uh, Paul Washington, uh, he passed away yesterday. And um, I bring up Paul because um, he not only was he close to me, but he was also one of the folks that uh, my PATH program uh, was going to help. Uh, Paul was uh, uh, born and raised here in Oakland. I mean, he has a very interesting past. Just to give you a little, little insight, uh, it was very interesting because there were a lot of things that, that uh, uh, this generation is uh, not passing information on. And so a lot of history gets uh, lost in the shuffle. And, and I bring Paul Washington up because uh, he has a very interesting uh, tie or very interesting ties to East Oakland. Uh, number one, um, he his family was one of the very first black families on 80th Avenue to buy a home in a whites only area. Yeah, and how that happened, it was because Paul's dad looked very Caucasian. He didn't look like a black uh, individual. He looked like a Caucasian individual. Very light hair, very fair skin, uh, clean shaven. And I, Paul showed me the picture of his mother and father. And his father was very Caucasian looking. His mother was... Uh, uh, pretty typical African-American looking woman, but when he purchased that home on 80th Avenue, uh, the real estate agent who showed uh, Mr. Washington that particular property totally assumed that he was Caucasian because of his features and his looks. He didn't have anything that appeared to be African-American. And so uh, the real estate uh, person uh, went ahead with the sale, the sale went through. Um, the realtor never needed the wife's signature back then. Yeah, pretty interesting. Times have changed a lot. Uh, but then after they were moved in, the realtor came by to visit and then that's when the real estate agent realized she had messed up. And uh, that's what cha started the change here in East Oakland back in the, the early days. Paul is six years older than me. And, and uh, his father worked in a steel mill as a machinist, so making really good money. Uh, so that's how he, you know, they, they lived pretty well. Uh, Paul, um, he was one of the uh, uh, disadvantaged uh, students in the sense that he was a little slower at learning. He wasn't the quickest kid on, on the block, but, but he was very street smart. He, he, he wasn't stupid, as we would say, and as Paul said, I'm not stupid. I just have to learn things in a different manner than most people. And that's what he did. And, and Paul had a really good life. He, he worked uh, with the Parks Department for most of his career. Then when uh, uh, there were cutbacks, he went uh, to work for uh, uh, a labor agency for a number of years. He injured himself, uh, a back injury. Uh, and then he um, developed uh, serious arthritis. Uh, and then it was actually the arthritis that got him state dis or federal disability uh, insurance um, approval. And so Paul was was actually living on um, his disability. Unfortunately, that disability was only $850 a month. Uh, and then throughout Paul's career, working career, he, even though he uh, paid in uh, a number for every year that he worked, that uh, his social security was about the same as his disability insurance. So when he reached 62, uh, his pay didn't change. Uh, and so uh, he was at an equal point. And so it, it 
I think it was only like two or three dollars difference uh, that he gained uh, by going to Social Security, which once you switch over to, to Social Security, you lose your disability insurance. So Paul still only had 850, well, 853 dollars to live on. And, and at one point, uh, Paul uh, was a homeowner. And, and then, uh, he sold his home. Uh, he sold the the, the uh, fourplex that he had, uh, and he did very well for a number of years. Paul, uh, even though he had a very low-paying job, that um, by buying back in in his time when he bought this uh, fourplex here in East Oakland, he rented out three of them. He re he redid the entire building, and because it was uh, low cost. Uh, back then, it's not like uh, a lot of contractors, you know, just ripping you off like nowadays. And so, anyway, Paul redid the entire home top to bottom, uh, rented out three of the four apartments, lived in number four. One, two, and three paid for number four to exist for free. And so, I, I saw see that a lot with uh, uh, small renters and, and Paul did uh, very well in a number of years and then uh, uh, he sold that and, and he needed the money to get by and, and um, the market was really good and and this was not that terribly long ago when when I lost everything in 2008 that's when uh, Paul was needing to sell his fourplex also and then shortly thereafter he went um, and I call him the invisible uh, homeless because while he wasn't on the street he still did not have a home of his own he actually uh, was invited to um, live with his sister and brother-in-law in the Oakland Hills uh, I got to meet Paul uh, I believe it was uh, 2012 when I first met Paul uh, I met him at a Royal Viejo uh, Park and, and you know we became friends and so we've been uh, friends for uh, nine years yeah. and unfortunately Paul passed on and, but anyway I bring up Paul again because he he was one of those kids um, Oakland School District was also trying to balance out uh, the black and white populations. Paul, uh, down here in East Oakland, had now become, uh, a lot of the Caucasian folks moved out and this became a black neighborhood. And a lot of parts of Oakland became black or and or Hispanic neighborhoods. Uh, I grew up here uh, in the uh, 60s and 70s, and I literally watched it go from a Caucasian uh, uh, dominant uh, area into predominantly a black neighborhood. Uh, and so I, I grew up in that, and, and a lot of folks say, well, how can you be comfortable with, with black folks? I said, well, why wouldn't I be? Number one, my nanny, from age one up until 15 raised me more than my mother and father actually did because they were so busy working. It was a very tumultuous period uh, here in the Bay Area because of the shipyards and then we had a lot of civil uh, uh, rights protests going on, especially in San Francisco around Union Square back then. So a lot of times my mother was not able to get home until very late at night because Macy's would lock the doors to protect the employees and then uh, uh, block things uh, while all the skirmishes and everything were taking place outside, literally outside the door. Because I remember seeing it on the news at times. So, oh my God, that's where mom works. And, and uh, then there were times that my dad, you now he's working 16 hour shifts because in my time, it was the Vietnam War, and then we needed to get ships and supplies over uh, seas very quickly, and we had MSC, which is a military sea lift command here in Middle Harbor in Oakland. They were a very uh, uh, vital role in uh, the war effort. Uh, a lot of uh, the, the medical supplies, we used to have two medical ships, hospital ships that were over there, plus the 30-day uh, ready ships, and there were eight of them. Uh, 
uh, including oilers, which would bring fuel and gasoline to the front lines. Uh, so there were a lot of things that the Bay Area was very involved with. And, and my dad, like I said, ended up working a lot of 16 hour days. And so uh, what ended up happening, uh, the family nanny who was at, of African-American descent, you know, she would take me back to her home in North Oakland in a predominantly black neighborhood. And, and I would spend the night there or uh, my mother would uh, pick me up sometime in the middle of the night and, and then bring me back home. And my dad, or my dad would pick me up on his way home from Hunter's Point Shipyard back in the day. So it was a very, very different time and period. But my Paul, my friend Paul Washington, he was one of those that uh, was bused up to Skyline High School. And at the time, you know, you know, they were trying to really integrate the schools and Paul was one of those fortunate uh, to be bused from East Oakland on 80th Avenue up to Skyline High. And that's where he attended classes with the real Tom Hanks back in high school. And so uh, it was really interesting. You, you go back and pull the, uh, the yearbooks for, uh, um, I forget what year it is, but anyway, Paul six years in front of me. So 1972, I think it is, uh, is six years, yeah, 72. Go pull 71, 70, 71, 72 Skyline yearbooks and uh, you probably will see Tom Hanks and my friend Paul Washington in, in the pictures there. So, uh, that's uh, one of Paul's claim to fame. And then also Paul had a picture of him and, and Janet Jackson, the real Janet Jackson. She was here at the Oakland Coliseum. He had won backstage passes uh, and the opportunity to actually meet with her. And, and so Paul was all excited about that. He, he, he was so proud of that picture. He said, hey, you wanna see a picture of my girlfriend? And then all of us like, oh, that's Janet Jackson. And he said, yep. <laughs> so anyway, Paul was a lot of fun. He, he was a very good friend. Um, he knew a lot about me. He knew about my past. He was one of the few people that, that truly knew me. And, and um, I got to know him. And, and he was just one of the, the guys from the hood here, just like I was. And, and so we had a lot of things in common. Uh, we were comfortable with each other. Paul was like a big brother to me. Paul was six years older than myself. And, and so he, he, he was uh, always there when I needed to go somewhere. He said, come on, I'll take you over there. And so he, he uh, became my unofficial driver uh, after um, uh, my cancer treatments and surgery. And, and he was there with me a lot for my recovery period. He would uh, be there to bring water, to, to bring food, check on my medical needs, pick up my prescriptions. And so Paul was a true friend and uh, better than a family member. Uh, and so Paul and I were always really close. Uh, and I, I know I'm going to miss him, but uh, again, he was one of the, the, the people that inspired my path plan. And, and my path plan has a lot of people that uh, showed me things, weaknesses in the system that need to be addressed. And so that's what PATH does. It addresses the weaknesses in our housing system. It's a non-competitive alternative uh, housing system. And it's not there to, to make anybody rich. Nobody's going to get rich on this, not the city, not the uh, homeowners, nobody's going to get rich quick. But it does guarantee housing stability and an asset if uh, you need it for some reason in the future. But anyway, thank you for joining me today. We'll be right back.